Well, today I'm going to be putting together a homemade dynamometer. This dyno is going to be used for small engine testing and tuning, for go-karting, for mini biking, and for some of my builds that I'm going to have coming up. Uh, I have a couple engines that are going to be testing this on. Uh, Tillerson 212R, brand new out of the box, and a Predator 212 non-hemi version uh, coming right out of the box for you here. I'm going to go over every single part around the dyno itself. And I just want to let you know if you're coming looking for something that has a bunch of graphs and a lot of different readouts for engine temperature and oil temperature, this is not necessarily going to be the video for that. This is just the first part where you get your pressure, your uh, foot-pounds of torque, and then you get a tachometer uh, coming into place so you can get your reading for RPMs. So this is a very simplistic small engine dyno to begin and be able to tune engines and get some uh, performance boosts out of that. After I go over the parts, I'll go over price a little bit, how much it costs. The whole setup here cost me under $500. Uh, and then you throw in some tax and some shipping, it costs about $545. This setup, you can save some money here and there, and I'll go over a couple money saving places in a uh, future part of the video. Um, but overall, uh, this, this is a very nice, simplistic, inexpensive setup. I'll go over the frame after I go over prices. I'll show you some of the measurements, what I did for my frame, the parts, and then usage. Well, you're going to have to check out an upcoming video. I'm going to try and keep this one short, but explaining every single part that's used and putting it together and the frame. It's going to be a longer video, so check up on my new videos coming up on how to use a homemade small engine dyno. Thank you. All right, not the most exciting part of the video, but a thorough part of the video that I'd like to throw in here really quick. Starting at the pump. Pump here is a dynamic fluid components, three quarter inch shaft pump. I picked that off of Amazon, but you can get it from places such as Northern Tool. It's one of those tried and true tested of pumps. I tried to source something that was going to be a good reliable pump. I'm going to go over the adapters. All of the adapters came from the same location with the exception of one, my one half inch to three quarter inch adapter. Just because it cost $30 at the same place, I sourced all of these, but $10 just straight off of Amazon. Uh, coming off of the pump of a 5 8 inch orb or a uh, SAE 10 uh, male to a one half inch NPTF female adapter. And all of the adapters here, uh, with the exception of the 12 SAE male coming into the pump and then the 10 SAE male coming out of the pump, are going to either be an NPTF, uh, where it's just straight going in, uh, or you're going to have an uh, NPSM swivel on there. So I will try to cut down some time in just going over with sizes. I have a 90 degree one half to one half, which is male to swivel. I have a couple of extenders here. This is just a one half to one half male female, a one half one half male male. Uh, an important thing for adjusting where I want to see my gauge is going to be a union T, which is one half inch, one half inch, one half inch, NPSM swivel. That goes into an elbow, which is an adapter. It's bringing a one half inch male down to a one quarter inch female. That goes into my gauge, the gauge, the presser gauge is a two and a half inch pressure gauge, liquid filled, uh, zero to 2000 PSI with a one quarter inch mount NPT. And I got that off of Amazon, that was about 10 bucks. I've got a one half inch, one half inch adapter, just put in a little bit of extension. This is where the pressure is gonna be building up. This is my pressure chamber. Going into the inline variable flow control valve. And this one I picked up off of Amazon as well. There are quite a few different options for this. This is just to be able to put some pressure inside of here, make the engine work a little bit. So inline variable control valve with uh, one half inch NPT connections. My first hydraulic hose, which is a higher pressure rated hydraulic hose. And that's just gonna be a one half inch and it's 48 inches long to be able to put it onto the frame. Coming off of the hose, I have a one half inch female swivel going to a three quarter inch male. The three quarter inch then goes into the tank. It is just a five gallon 
hydraulic reservoir. You can save some money a little bit if you don't want to go with the tank. If you have an old propane tank, such as this one here, you can actually weld a couple fittings on there, save some money. You have to be really careful so you don't blow yourself up in the process, but hopefully at that point, you know what you're doing with welding. Coming out of the tank, I have that one-off adapter. You can get it at the same place. I tried to source all of these parts so you can find them easily. I have a one-half inch by three-quarter inch, or two three-quarter inch uh, adapter, and that comes out of the tank. Then I have an elbow here that's just three quarter inch, three quarter inch. Second hydraulic line coming out here, which is a three quarter inch by four foot long hydraulic hose. Also got that one off of Amazon. It's gonna come up to another um, elbow, 90 degree elbow, three quarter by three quarter. Coming into my three quarter NPTF female by three quarter orb or SAE 12 male that's going to have an o-ring on it going right into the pump now this little homemade bomb looking setup here is actually my tachometer uh i did something custom here you're not necessarily going to be able to find too easily i wanted a switch so i can turn this off and on i wanted a battery housing a little indicator light it was on so i just took an old radio control off of a radio control car that i threw out the car well i actually jumped the cars off of a cliff took that video down but it was a bit fun to retire the cars that way I have it now used as a battery box for my tachometer and that tachometer is just a cheapo that I picked up off of uh, Amazon again. It was $20. I have a fully adjustable motor mounting plate so I can actually use it for chain tensioning as well as making sure that the chain is in proper alignment depending on which engines I have in place. I have some Teflon tape to uh, secure everything in place. I have a clutch that I've taken apart here. And I'm not necessarily going to recommend this model, or, well, I'm not going to recommend this model at all. It was a cheapo one. It's a little bit difficult to come by some of the parts when I was ordering them here. Uh, some world events going on. And I did secure a magnet in there for the tachometer. That magnet at higher RPMs, this is not the method to use it because it could potentially fly out at high RPMs. However, I countersunk the magnet in there and made sure that it was smooth for the clutch. I am going to be using size 40 chain, so I bought 10 foot of size 40 chain. It did come with two master links in that kit that I came with. And then I have a sprocket, which is a little bit hard to find, which is a size 40 sprocket with 36 teeth. Just going to get a quick price on everything for you, just so you can see about how much all this stuff has cost. I'm going to try and get everything in the description below for you. I have everything written out. Pump costs about $110. Pressure gauge costs about $10. Uh, control valve costs about $40, the tachometer $20, the chain with the master links was about $17. Bucks. The sprocket, the sprocket was a little bit more expensive than I had uh, hoped for, it was about $36. A clutch can cost you about uh, $20 to $25. The motor mount plate itself here I had for, picked up for $31. Teflon tape is about a uh, dollar to $2 for a roll. The tank costs about 70 or so dollars. All of the hydraulic fittings together cost me about $45 or so. And then the hydraulic fluid picked up a five gallon tank for about $35 for just tractor transmission hydraulic fluid. Well, I'm just gonna show you really quick what I did with my frame. Uh, the part that was homemade is gonna be this top part. And that is made out of some scrap, uh, two inch by two inch angle iron you can pick this angle iron up pretty easily pretty cheap that's why i used it is that it's pretty easy to come by and then i made my frame structure for that I made a mounting uh, plate, mounting base for the the tank uh, away from the engine and the gear components. I I know that a lot of dynamometers actually have the chain and the gears drop down into it, but I kind of wanted to position things off and away. Uh, the part that I purchased and the reason that I did the dimensions that I did, which was 48 inches long by just barely, like a, a sixteenth of an inch less than 24 inches coming in this direction here was so that I could put it on a very commonly seen frame 
which is really just a shelving unit. So these are pretty common to find, and I didn't want to make everything. I wanted some shelves down below, some adjustability, and I chose a shelving unit to be able to put everything together. I did do a couple tack welds. I may change up this motor mount where I have this position, and I'm thinking about putting something a little bit closer for my smaller engines, but I want it to be able to accommodate for some larger engines as well. The bolts I'm using here, I'm using one and one quarter inch by three eighth inch carriage bolts. I am using four two and a half inch long by one quarter inch bolts to use as motor mounts to put the motor mount on place. And I'm using four five eighths inch by one quarter inch bolt bolts to hold the, the tank in place. And these are metal locking nuts that I have in place here. Some of the dimensions that I'll give you really quick, 48 inches by just a little bit less than 24 inches wide. Uh, the first beam is going to be marked at 6 inches away here to 8 inches, so 6 to 8 inches is where I have my first beam. And that's for structural support for this. The big measurement that you want isn't actually going to be the distance away from the edge for the two uprights, but actually the measurement in the middle here, which is gonna be three and a half inches away from one another. Beams uh, support for the motor mounts themselves. But I made those out at 21 inches, and then 21 to 23 inches here, and then I have my secondary mount is gonna be coming in at 24 and a half inches to 26 and a half inches there. And then I just used some one inch tube or a one inch squared steel to, to put the motor mount on. And those are, I believe, six inches. Yes, those are six inches. These two um, uprights over here, I have at roughly nine inches long. And I did make them a little bit taller and larger both for guards in case anything happens with the chain, but if I need to add some, some uh, stability on there, I, I can just add a cross member over here and add a lot of structural support for that. This gives me a lot of working room over here, putting my engine on, and then again, I'm gonna be putting some guards in place up here, uh, some marine grade plywood and some other sort of structures just to keep it in case anything does happen with the engine and, or anything happens with that chain. On the bottom here, I'm going to be putting in a few casters so that I can move the rack very easily once I have my needs so that I don't have the fumes stuck inside of a garage shop thing. I'm going to be able to wheel it out into the open clean air. Now this pump actually comes clockwise direction. So if you're running some of the older American Briggs models, the five horsepower Briggs, this pump is going to be set up perfectly right out of the box. However, I'm going to be reversing the flow and it takes about a minute to do so. You need a very large Allen key to do it. Five sixteenths. Just going to set this up in a counterclockwise direction for the GX200 clones. The Predator, the Tillotson, they all run in a counterclockwise direction. That is very important so you actually get flow going through the pump. You can see down here, fluid just coming out of the, coming out of the hose. And if you notice on my pump here, it's going to be arrow is up, but I'm going to have quite a bit of space underneath the frame. Well, almost assembled here and things are about to get a little bit messy. The oil is in place. All right, so you should be able to get needle to move by turning the wheel when you have your valve all the way closed. However, when you're going to start this for the first time and for subsequent times, you want to make sure that your valve is all the way up which means that you move it all the way up and start to move the wheel and you'll notice that the needle doesn't move at all. So I do have pressure in here. I do have good pressure in here. Everything's flowing in the right direction. And right now I'm just going to be leaving it for a little bit, making sure that I don't have any leaks anywhere. This is where I probably had the most difficulty in where I was going to be having some leverage. These things will move around. I want to make sure that here and mainly here, which is where my hydraulic pressure is going to be coming in, I don't have any leaks. This all needs to be very tight. I like the way that it's set up here. It's a good chamber. You can see that I got some pressure and I want to make sure that I don't have any leaks coming out on either side. Now, one thing I will mention in this design, I do not have a hydraulic filter. To do a hydraulic filter, it would be very easy. You just take this 
half inch line, you run it into the filter, run the filter up, you're going to have to have another hydraulic line, a couple adapters, and put things in place. So, there will be a few things. You notice the chain, the chain is a bit longer on this model. Uh, I made the chain a little bit longer. I'm going to be putting in an additional mount. Smaller engines are going to be mounted closer to it and they're going to have a shorter chain. Larger engines are going to have this mount here and I just wanted to make sure that everything was set up for that. I want to do some 420 blocks on here, but I don't really want to go over 20 horsepower. This is a homemade dyno. I don't know what the rating is. It's one of those where you're taking your own risks. And there are a lot of dangers in running the dyno. So, just going to keep it light for the time being. Alright, well I have, I have the thing on wheels. I have it moving. I'll just give you a quick close-up of it here as it's assembled. And then I'll go over a couple more things that are going to be important to cover. Just have the leads coming in and out of the tank. I've got the engine on the mount. Have my pressure chamber ready to go. Control valve. I have the gear on the pump. And I've got my chain sized up. Threw on the tachometer just quickly using a piece of one by one. This is just a ground stake or ground post that I used the holes that were pre-existing, drilled a couple holes into my frame, a couple of washers in there for spacers, and then drilled out a hole for the, uh, the reader over here. Tachometer itself is really just gonna be held on by zip ties. Just a couple of zip ties so I can move it around as needed. Well, this video is taking a little bit longer than I wanted to, so I'm going to split it up into two videos. Please do like. Well, thanks for checking out the video. That's how I put together my homemade dyno. This video is taking a little bit longer than I wanted to, so I'm going to split this into two videos. One, how to make it. You just watched it. And the second one, how to actually use it, how to tune this and how to get your readings. I do have some calculations. I'm working through them right now just because one of my engines is having a little bit of a backfire problem. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you have a great day.